last week we started with uh, be impeccable with your word. We're studying the four agreements based on the work of Don Miguel Ruiz that comes from Toltec wisdom. And so if you're just joining us, you'll, you'll just slide right in down the highway here on number two, which is don't take anything personally. Yeah, you're right. Everybody always has a reaction to this one. It's like, anybody ever not take anything personally? <laughs> We're going to work on that today, yeah. And what's interesting, the semantics are important to pay attention here in this agreement. He doesn't say don't take it personally. He says don't take anything personally. That's a pretty high bar, isn't it? So, but we like a high bar here, don't we? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Bring it on. Bring it on. That's right. So this weekend, as you know, is a celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. on Monday. And um, I was thinking about, you know, what if Martin Luther King Jr. had taken the things that were said about him as an African-American man personally? We wouldn't have had a civil rights movement. <laughs> because he would have been in that place of victimhood. But he was the kind of person who was able to transform that and to offer that up, not personally, but universally. And that's kind of where we're headed today is, how can we work with this principle in that way? How can we work with this agreement in that, that way? Elaine Savage wrote a book called Don't Take It Personally, The Art of Dealing with Rejection. And in it, she tells a story about an agreement that she made as a young woman. And, you know, we talk about how these agreements get made early on, the false agreements, the agreements we don't want to keep anymore that are holding us back. But by taking up the four agreements and really living those, those old agreements get broken and get left behind, the ones that are holding us back. In Elaine's case, the one that she had taken on was, I am so lazy. And where it, the genesis of that that she realized was, was a little bit after she had told a coworker that um, she just said that because she was so used to saying it. For decades, she always said that about herself. It came from a time when she was at her aunt's house and, and her aunt had um, said to somebody on the phone, she's just so lazy. And so she just really internalized that. And so she says this to this friend, and the friend, or the coworker, coworker and friend, and the person says back to her, are you kidding me? How can you say that about yourself? You work full time, you have small children, and you find time to write. Where, how, what part of you could possibly be lazy? And as she thought about it, she realized that she had always said this about herself and kind of just, you know, really on autopilot, was just kind of walking through life believing this about herself. So she decided to call her aunt up and say, hey, auntie, you know, do you remember when I was really young, because I remember this time I was visiting and you said, she's just so lazy on the phone. And it, you know, it's just really, I really took it to heart. And the aunt says, oh, honey, I would have never said that about you. I was probably talking about the cat. <laughs> she said, I always called her lazy. And, you know, it's like these moments, right, of, oh, you know, where we just realize, wow, that has been holding me back for so long. And, you know, all the antics that we do around that, you got to believe that, that this woman was probably doing everything she could possibly do to prove to herself and the world that she was not lazy, you know, because that's kind of what we do, right? We either totally accept it and we show up that way or we try to do the antithesis of it you know, in some way. So these are kind of our, are the ego games that we play, right? But when we bring the spiritual light to it, a whole different possibility opens up to us. And that's what the four agreements do. They give us these really practical, simple agreements, a new agreement to make. And when we make it, when we own it, our lives totally shift. And so by taking up, don't take anything personally, if you really take it on this week, Watch how things will shift for you. It's amazing, really. Don Miguel Ruiz says, if you practice the first two agreements, 75% of the little teeny tiny agreements that have kept you trapped in hell will dissipate, <laughs> essentially, or will break those agreements. So this idea of taking things personally, it's when we define ourselves and our happiness by that which others believe about us or say about us 
or probably more insidious and more importantly, what we believe and say to ourselves. It's our own opinions about ourselves that we shouldn't take personally because that's really where we're triggered because we if we wouldn't have a reaction if we didn't believe it about ourselves, right? We wouldn't have a reaction. It's a matching picture game. So it's like if I have this agreement, you know, I'm not important or I'm lazy, then, then the words that come along or the things that come along that match that agreement are going to have a reaction for us. But if we don't have that agreement, they'll just bounce right off of us, right? We won't even pay attention to them. We won't even notice, in fact, what was said. And so that's the beauty of this work. It really happens in sort of a almost magical way when we just focus on where it is that we want to head, where we want to go, how we want to show up. So it's like we kind of, when we're keeping the idea of taking things personally, we're defining ourselves by, we're saying, I am what others think of me, or worse yet, I am what I am afraid I am, <laughs> right? And so those two just sort of begin to, to meld together. But today we're not about staying there, we're about moving beyond that. Lucy was somebody who held the agreement, I'm not important. And see, the thing is, when we hold these agreements, we can find all kinds of evidence. You know, we could even keep like a little book of evidence, you know, because that, <laughs> that would begin to help us see how, how we're reacting to things based on an agreement. So Lucy makes breakfast for her partner, and he doesn't say anything. And, you know, so, she, so he doesn't thank her. And so she's thinking, wow, I'm not really important. My actions don't really matter. She goes to, to work that day, and a coworker passes her in the hall and doesn't say hello. It reinforces again, I'm not very important. Her mom calls her up later that day and talks all about her sister and never asks Lucy how she is. Well, I'm not important. And so over and over again, this old agreement gets reinforced for her. But what if Lucy committed instead to the new agreement, don't take anything personally? Well, everything would shift, wouldn't it? And so those things would fall away. Her energy would be higher. Her day would not be ruined by these incidences that probably meant nothing to the other people. And, and she would be able to then flow with a natural energy of spirit that is available to her. So we have this sort of damned up kind of energy that is opened up, the doors are opened up when we say yes to these new agreements and the old ones just kind of break down on their own. Miguel Ruiz talks about this kind of thing as when we take things personally, essentially we're taking in emotional poison. You know, so it's, we, we make the choice, we have that agreement and we make a choice, we can do it in several different ways. We can swallow the poison you know, and just let it sort of fester in our minds and our bodies. Or we can spit it out, spit it back, you know, in an offensive way, spit it back and try to hurt someone else because we feel hurt. Or spit it back in a defensive way and trying to explain ourselves. Anybody ever do any of these? <laughs> no, not us, right? <laughs> And so we can choose instead, there's another option. I mean, that's the good news. We don't have to have the emotional poison at all. <laughs> we can choose instead another way. In fact, we can even choose to alchemize the situation, take that, that poison in our own spiritual chemistry and transform it into something beautiful. You know about the art of alchemy in the old days where they would take a, um, a kind of metal that was very ordinary and had very little value and alchemize it through a process that turned it into a precious metal like gold. And it's the same idea in spirituality is that we can take something that we think isn't that great of a situation or like a really horrible situation in our dramatic interpretation of it, but we could actually instead look for what might there, maybe there's some little bit of value in there, you know? I'm always astounded at the number of people who have told me, and I bet you've heard it too, that their cancer was a blessing. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah, look at all the hands. So there has been so many people who have gone through that very difficult thing that none of us would choose to have, and yet they have found an incredible blessing out of it. In fact, I've heard people say, I, I thank 
God for that experience because I wouldn't have otherwise transformed in the way that I transformed. I wouldn't have had all these breakthroughs I had in my life about my body or my relationships or my world or my work or my divine purpose in life. All those ahas, that path, that soul's path, actually was see- that experience on that soul's path was seen as a, a rich blessing. So it's these, this kind of alchemizing, this kind of, of spiritual alchemy and, and really emotional alchemy that can really serve us by taking on this agreement. Anybody ever remember the story of Joseph from the Hebrew scriptures? It's actually a really long story, so if you remember it, I'm quite impressed because it like spans many chapters. But a lot of stuff happens to Joseph. I mean, he starts out pretty good. He's like the favorite of Jacob. He's the favorite of all the 12 sons, and, and he's favored in many ways. Joseph is a, unusual in that he's kind of a visionary. He's a dreamer. He likes to interpret the stars, and he interprets dreams, and he's, he's different than his brothers. And so his father takes kind of a shine to him, and the brothers get very, very jealous about this. So jealous, in fact, that they throw him down a well and leave him for dead. And then later they sell him into slavery in Egypt when he gets out of the well. And he doesn't take it personally. I mean, why would he, right? (laughs) These are pretty extreme examples. But the thing is, he doesn't take it personally because he is so aligned with his spirit that he really just turns to God in prayer to see what is his to do. He doesn't pay attention to that which is happening in kind of a limited way around him through limited lenses and egos. Instead, he says, what's here for me? What's next for me? What's part of this soul's journey? I'm not saying he didn't have feelings about it. I'm sure he did. He's a human being. <laughs> but, but in the story, we hear about the, the spiritual side of it, right? Of course, we hear about the side of the alchemy, the side of the transformation, the side of what, how can we make good of a situation that seems so bad in every way? And so he moves on through his life and he ends up at the Pharaoh's palace and he has, you know, kind of a, um, a role in the Pharaoh's palace. But then uh, the Pharaoh's wife accuses him wrongly of adultery and he's imprisoned. Once again, he doesn't take it personally. Instead, he sort of buoys up his prayerful life even more and he does what he does best. He actually interprets the dreams of the other prisoners and one of the prisoners, when he gets free, he says, hey, let the Pharaoh know, you know, that I have this gift and maybe I could get out of here. Well, the guy forgets as soon as he's freed. And so he spends a couple more years in prison. And then one day the Pharaoh has all these dreams and nobody in the land, he brings all these seers and sages and interpreters to interpret his dream and nobody does it to his satisfaction. And that's when the prisoner remembers, oh, hey, there's a guy down in the, you know, the root cellar <laughs> who does a really good job of this. And so Joseph is brought up. He, he interprets the Pharaoh's dreams in a really beautiful and, and visionary kind of way that rings true for the Pharaoh. And so he's given a high position in, in the palace. And then he has, as life often does, that full circle experience where all of his brothers come not knowing that it's him, come before this man of power in order to, to get relief from the famine that they're, they're fleeing from from their land. Joseph has yet another opportunity. Will he retaliate? Will he forgive? And his brothers are astounding, astounded when he forgives them. And what he says is the key here. He says, you meant it for evil but God meant it for good. If we can remember just that, (laughs) that God means it for good, and even others may not necessarily mean it for evil, I don't like to even think that, but it's coming from a place of fear in them, right? Or unskillfulness. They just haven't realized yet that making these agreements and keeping these four agreements would change their lives. And so out of their own hurt, out of their own pain, out of their own fear, they do things that we wish wouldn't be done in our world or to us or that we do to each other, whatever it may be. But to remember that God meant it for good. You may have meant to be hurtful or you may have not known how to be skillful, but God meant it for good. 
If we can use that as a mantra, then when difficult things happen, we then immediately put our attention and our energy on what is good. What is the blessing here? What's the potential possibility here? We won't necessarily see it in the moment, but, or we might, I don't know, you know, but if we are willing to just kind of open it up like a treasure chest and say somewhere in here there's a blessing, you know, and, and I know that God means this for good, now, some situations, it's not really worth all that attention. Some situations, like Jesus said once, if I'm not welcome somewhere, I just dust, you know, take, dust my feet off and, and leave. <laughs> so it's, there's also that wisdom piece in there for you to really be with. Is this a situation where I just need to dust off my feet and move on? Or is this a situation where I'm really going to be with it and open up the treasure chest and see if there are be something in there that could be turned, alchemized into precious metal, into precious gold, into precious truth. And so that decision is always up to us. But if we're yet saying yes to these agreements, it'll get clearer and clearer what is our action to take in these various scenarios of life. Because life, let's face it, throws us a lot of adversity, right? <laughs> There's lots of opportunity for contrast in the world. That's what the world's all about. It's like we take our, our spiritual beings, ourselves, our truth, our knowing, and we get to be on this earth incarnated as a spiritual being in a physical world, in a physical body, where there will be these experiences of contrast and adversity. It's part of what we signed up for. I know we don't all remember. You know, but I really do believe we all at one point very consciously said, pick me, I will go. I want to go. I want to grow. I want to move through any difficult barriers. I want to be a, a bringer of the light to earth. I know we all signed up for that at some point in some conscious way. So to just remember, I came here to be a bringer of the light. God means it for good, whatever happens here. And I'm one who can help alchemize the situation. So instead of taking things personally, we can take them universally. So instead of just, you know, taking it as, oh, poor me, instead it's like, what's here for me? And make it something bigger and more powerful. For example, Martin Luther King said, I look to the day when a man, and I'm sure he meant a woman too, is not judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. That's taking something that could have been so personal, so crushing, so victimizing, and saying, no, 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 no. I'm not about the ego. I'm about taking this and lifting it up. And we can all resonate with that truth, right? That we all want only to be assessed by the content of our character. None of these silly, surfacey things that we've made up in our world that have created so much pain. And yet, always there's a gem there. Always there's an opportunity there for great healing, for great revelation of spirit in the world. And it's for us to take one step at a time. You know, it's important that we realize that you know, sometimes when we think of these greats like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or others, it's like, well, yeah, okay, great but aspiring to that, Jesus, Buddha, you know, is sometimes difficult for us. But here's the thing, all of the great masters and all of the great, you know, historical figures that we, we praise and look up to, they took it one step at a time, one change at a time. The stories that we hear about, yeah, they're the big wow stories, right? And we think it just happened overnight that Rosa Parks just stood, you know, said, I would like a seat, please, and took a seat on the bus. It wasn't overnight. She was an activist for decades. It was one small act at a time that built up to that big, seemingly heroic moment. And so it is for all of us. It's one small interaction at a time, one moment at a time, one relationship at a time. And with heightened awareness, we don't just let things roll off our back. It's not, that's not necessarily about don't take anything personally. It's more than that. It's, it's, a, it's a willingness, yes, we won't notice some things because we don't have the agreement, and so great, we don't have to be bogged down by that. But where we do get hooked in, it's, it's realizing there's an opportunity there. And that's 
really taking this agreement to its deepest intended level, to take it universally up levels it to the possibility that it could be a gift to ourselves and to the world. Now, our favorite thing to take personally, let's get serious here, is compliments, right? Who doesn't want to take a compliment serious, or uh, personally, <laughs> and seriously? <laughs> but it's, you know, it's even that, that's why he says don't take anything personally, because even that can trip us up. Now, what we can do is be gracious about it and to recognize that we are being good channels of the source when somebody recognizes something good in us. The credit goes to spirit. The credit goes to us getting out of the way to let spirit shine. <laughs> and so if we can remember that, we won't get hooked into this need to be validated or this need to have acknowledgement and recognition all the time, because that's the danger of taking even positive things personally. So instead, we just let it move through us, you know? Thank you, we can say thank you, but it's in that gracious knowing that it comes from, we've revealed the truth of who we are, the divinity that we are. We've been this really open and clear channel. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm a lot happier about that idea than anything I could do in my physical experience of only my ego and, and mind and, and body but the truth and the wholeness of us, it opens it up in a whole nother way. So, where do we go from here? When we find ourselves in a place where we are taking things personally, we don't have to be hard on ourselves. Instead, we could just say some kind of mantra that moves us through that experience. Like, neither blame nor praise defines me. Neither blame nor, nor praise defines me. And so when we find ourselves beginning to get hooked in, we just say that to ourselves. It doesn't define who I am, what this person thinks of me, what they're saying right now. It doesn't define anything. And so it lets us then rest in the truth of who we are and still um, be appreciative of the walk through the planet, <laughs> the experience on Earth. Our worth, then, we know is intrinsic. You know, it's our birthright. It comes with being a spiritual being. So our, our appreciation for ourselves, our intrinsic knowing of who we are, is a remembering of that, of the truth of who we are, identifying with that part of ourselves, that essence of ourselves. And then to remember to take it universally, to remember that God means it for good, the good of all. So I'd like to close with a passage from the Tao Te Ching that I think really um, kind of encapsulates this. This is from verses 22 and 79. The wise stand out because they see themselves as part of the whole. They shine because they don't want to impress. They achieve great things because they don't look for recognition. Their wisdom is contained in what they are, not their opinions. They refuse to argue, so no one argues with them. The wise act well without demanding that others do. Someone who ignores natural goodness is always concerned that they are properly honored. Someone who knows natural goodness honors their side of the relationship regardless. Good wise words to live by, aren't they? And so as we move into this agreement this week and really hold this agreement, don't take anything personally. Look for the opportunities to alchemize a situation, to lift it up, to take it universally, or to just let it go and allow it to fall away from you because there's no need to give it any energy. And you'll know which direction to go by following that inner wisdom. Let's know this together about this natural goodness from which we come that the Tao Te Ching just referred to, the essence of who we are. And let's, let's affirm it together as we kick off our week of this new agreement. Together, I interact with the world knowing I am naturally good. I don't take anything personally. And so it is.
Thank you.